Shall we talk about our scriptures before we begin Mass? So our first reading today comes from the second book of Samuel. The second book of Samuel, we know, focuses on King David and the events that were happening during that time, the time of his reign. So in that time, we see the first reading, how it is that King David is sleeping in his nice, warm palace, thinking about how it is that God's arrangements are that night. Okay, so where was God sleeping that night? In the ancient Israelites' mind, they were thinking that God dwelled in the Ark of the Covenant. So the question is, what is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant was believed to be during the Exodus, when we were, when we were released from Egypt, we carried the law in an Ark, this big box. For those of us who have seen the movie Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, what are they looking for? The Lost Ark refers to the Ark of the Covenant. It was this box made out of acacia wood, which was carried by four men, and inside it had various artifacts from our journey in the desert, including the Ten Commandments, including Aaron's rod, and including a bit of manna, which is interesting since manna always evaporated. It dried up, it disappeared when the sun came up in the morning. So there were various artifacts inside this ark. What did we say that the ark was made of? Acacia wood, which is why every August the 15th on the Solemnity of the Assumption of Mary, we hear stories of the ark being taken up to the temple in Jerusalem. Why? Because it was believed that acacia wood would not rot. So it was believed that acacia wood would be around forever, for a long time. So it became a symbol of Mary on the Assumption, what we celebrate, the fact that her body did not rot in a grave like our bodies will, but instead how it was that she was assumed in the heavenly glory, body and soul. So Mary's body did not rot, so in many ways it was like the Ark of the Covenant, which was made of acacia wood, which at that time was believed would not rot. So David, once he succeeded in uniting these kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel in the north and Judah in the south, he needed to establish a capital. And what was David's capital? His new capital would be Jerusalem. So David brought the Ark of the Covenant in procession with singing and dancing into Jerusalem. And now in today's first reading then, David is, is, is unable to sleep at night simply because it says, David's words are, here I am living in a house of cedar while the Ark of God dwells where? In a tent. So there is the Ark of God's Covenant. We believe that to be the, in that time, the, our ancient ancestors believed that to be the presence of God among us. God was present in the ark. Here I am sleeping in this palace made of cedar, and where is God sleeping tonight? In a tent. So how it is that David has this idea of building a house for God, we know it today is the Jerusalem temple. And so... The Lord says in this vision of today's first reading, Should you build me a house to dwell in? I have been with you wherever you went. God was with the Israelite people, leading them out of slavery through the desert into the promised land. That ark was there with the people. So God affirms how it is that God was with them wherever they went. God destroyed all of their enemies before them. And how it is then that, that God would have a home among the people in the Jerusalem temple. How fascinating, because at Advent, what do we celebrate at, during Advent? We're waiting for God to come among God's people and to establish God's dwelling among us in the one made flesh, who is Jesus. So in the same way that we welcome the Ark of the Covenant and made a home for it, in the same way during these weeks of Advent, we should be welcoming the presence of Christ and making a home for Christ in our hearts and in our world. The first reading ends, I will raise up after your, I will raise up an heir after you, sprung from your loins, and I will make his kingdom firm. So what a fascinating promise to David, that David would have an offspring. We know that Jesus came from the house of David, according to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. That was important for them to say how it was that Jesus came from the family of David. 
and how it is then that this prophecy in today's first reading from the prophet Nathan would be fulfilled of God raising up an heir to David's throne in Jesus. That's today's first reading. Today's second reading, we have Paul's letter to the Romans. We know that Paul's letter to the Romans was one that he wrote before going to Rome, which is where we believe he would later die. So he was writing this letter to Rome in advance of his trip. And probably the most important line for us on this fourth Sunday of Advent is that third line where Paul talks about the revelation of the mystery kept secret for long ages. How is it that God has kept this thing secret? It's almost like God has been silent all these ages, but pretty soon the mystery is going to be revealed. And how is the mystery of, of, of our salvation revealed? In the person of Jesus. Today's gospel is the story of the Annunciation. How interesting that we celebrate Christmas during the winter solstice. What is it that we celebrate nine months before? So the early church took the celebration of Christ at Christmas, which we celebrate on the winter solstice, and then looked back nine months and said, well, Mary must have become pregnant then somewhere around the spring equinox. So what do we celebrate around the spring equinox every year? The Annunciation, which is Mary being told that she would be the mother of the Lord. Mary, the announcement that Mary was pregnant by the angel Gabriel. It's that story of the Annunciation that we have in today's Gospel, where the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, who was betrothed to a man named Joseph of, of the house of David. How interesting, going back to that first reading, is that what that line? How is that Joseph was of the house of David? So how it was that this heir would be raised up in the house of David? When the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, what does the angel Gabriel say? Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Have you heard those words before? Every time we pray the Hail Mary, what do we say? Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Where do those words come from? From today's gospel, the story of the Annunciation. The angel appears to Mary and says, Hail, full of grace. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee, is how the King James Bible translated it. Today's words in modern English is, The Lord is with you. So those words from the Hail Mary come from today's gospel. The angel tells Mary not to be afraid and then shares with her the news. Today's gospel is a birth announcement. In the same way that God announced the birth of Isaac and Samson and Samuel in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in today's gospel, the angel is announcing the birth of Mary's son, saying, Mary, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. We saw how it was that in the Gospel of Luke, Luke focuses on Mary receiving the visit from an angel, and that Mary will give that child the name Jesus. St. Matthew is different. St. Matthew appears to Joseph and tells Joseph to give the child the name Jesus. So, we have here then, in this Gospel, how it is that the angel comes and affirms how it is that Mary is going to experience this irregular birth, how it is that the power of God will overshadow her, and she will conceive of the Holy Spirit. It's a very irregular thing. We all know that in order to have a baby, you need two people, a mother and a father. According to the story that comes down to us from the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, did Jesus have a biological father who had relations with Mary? This story tells us how it is that Mary is going to have this irregular birth as a result of being overshadowed by God and conceived by the Holy Spirit. But don't worry, there's another irregular birth of which this angel speaks. What was the other irregular birth? Mary's relative. The angel says, Behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. We all know that a certain age arrives in our lives. For women, a certain age arrives at which we're no longer able to give birth, at which we're no longer fertile, we're no longer able to share the gift of life. Elizabeth had passed that age. She was now advanced in years, and what was the irregular birth announcement that she was given? That even though she was past the age of giving birth, that she would now have a son. 
In the Gospel of Luke, we know him as John the Baptist. So Mary's birth is very irregular, but we know that preparing for that is also Elizabeth, Mary's relative, who is also going to have an irregular birth in, in that she was advanced in age. She was bought beyond her childbearing years, and still she was going to have a son. Impossible, right? Which is why today's gospel is so important, because the angel affirms that nothing is impossible for God. And that thought has filled our Christian imagination for years, that as the angel said to Mary, nothing is impossible for God. Do you think something is impossible for God? No. Nothing is impossible for God was the message of the angel. And Mary, in the end of today's gospel, says, May it be done to me according to your word. Mary tells the angel, what you've just said about me being pregnant and giving birth to God's son, may that come true in me. She said yes to God. She opened the doors of her heart to God, saying yes, that she would be the mother of the Lord. And as a result, today we celebrate Mary as the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. During this fourth Sunday of Advent, the focus turns from John the Baptist and from the end of time to now Mary preparing to give birth to her son. With this fourth Sunday of Advent, we have this reading of the Annunciation, this gospel in which the angel comes to Mary preparing her for the birth of her son. As we celebrate this fourth Sunday of Advent, then, let's focus then on how it is that we are preparing our hearts and how it is that we're preparing our lives to receive Christ. How it is that we're prepared to receive Christ at Christmas and how it is that throughout the year we're preparing ourselves to receive Christ in different ways. In the faces of those around us and our family members and friends and co-workers and neighbors and yes, even our enemies. How are we receiving Christ in them? And also, every time we celebrate Mass, how are we receiving Christ in the Word of God and in the Eucharist that we celebrate? 